Uh, great. Well, thank you so much for um, uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Boris Lorberg. I'm um, an assistant professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Um, I also work as an associate medical director uh, in my clinical and administrative position uh, at the Adolescent Continuum Care Units at the Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital. Um, Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital is a state psychiatric hospital um, for um, both adults and adolescents, and I work on the adolescent units for patients who are uh, treatment refractory um, and they have um, been unable to improve in spite of all of the standard outpatient, residential, inpatient care in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I do not have any um, uh, conflicts of interest in, in terms of this presentation. And um, um, let's begin. So the objective of this presentation is to um, help um, participants um, to learn about the general evidence base for psychopharmacology in youth and uh, also to have a, a systematic approach to medication choice um, in children and adolescents. Um, so um, in general, uh, psychopharmacology evaluation in children and adolescents um, should include a systematic review of symptoms. And I usually uh, break uh, symptoms down into uh, several areas um, so I don't miss um, any um, of the specific areas. And I usually ask about mood, um, psychosis, um, sleep, um, anxiety, and OCD symptoms. I um, make sure to, to remember to ask about any trauma, uh, history, and symptoms. Um, I also ask about um, ADHD and learning disability symptoms. Um, um, if I get a sense that it's important, um, I may add questions about autism, um, I always um, try to remember to ask about substance use disorders. Um, and as in any uh, psychiatric evaluation, it's important to also assess um, level of current and past safety and risk. Um, so you have a sense of um, what, what you may need to do um, if um, any risk issues um, arise in terms of safety to self or others. The other part of the psychopharmacology evaluation um, includes um, a careful um, timeline of uh, symptoms as well as any changes in the environment and stressors. Um, so um, I try to uh, find out um, currently what, for example, what what is the level of depression if there is depression. Um, and what I try to do is I, I ask um, uh, patients and uh, often they're able to respond, sometimes they're not, but I ask them to rate um, the level of their, uh, the intensity of, of their specific symptoms. So for example, if it's depression, I ask them to rate depression from zero to 10. And I say, um, imagine that zero is no depression at all. And 10 is the most um, intense and severe depression you could ever imagine. Um, where, what number are you right now? Um, and so that's one question. And the other question I ask um, to get a sense of their timeline is when when did it change? Um, at what time was it the most intense in the past? Um, so that I get a, a natural history of, of the specific um, symptom. Um, of course, it's also important to um, ask about family dynamics and systems issues. Um, as part of learning about uh, the stressors and as part of uh, getting a better sense of the uh, of the biopsychosocial uh, formulation of the patient. Um, developmental history, of course, is important. Um, things like um, uh, developmental, developmental milestones, uh, speaking, walking, uh, whether that was on time or delayed. Um, it's important to ask about school. Um, in medical history, um, I try to get as, as careful a history of medication trials as possible. Um, and um, in a psychopharmacological evaluation, that's one of the most important parts of the of, of my um, of my task is to get a sense of 
uh, was the medication tried? Was there a positive effect? Was there a side effect? Was there a no effect? Um, and what was the um, dose of the medicine and what was the duration of the trial? So I get a sense of um, where, um, where I might stand um, in terms of future um, options. It's also important to uh, find out about any vitamins or supplements or alternate, alternative treatments uh, because those, uh, of course, can um, interact with medications. Uh, family history is important. Um, so, for example, if um, um, I'm seeing an adolescent who has a family history of bipolar disorder, and currently the adolescent is presenting with um, mostly depression, some irritability, but no clear um, bipolar 1 or bipolar 2, um, I may be more likely to consider that uh, this person is at risk for developing bipolar disorder in the future based on their um, history, family history of bipolar disorder. And of course, a physical examination is, is important as well um, to get uh, uh, the vital signs and to make sure that there are no medical conditions that may um, interact or um, exacerbate um, their psychiatric uh, condition. So this is a slide that um, um, I borrowed from Dr. Jean Frazier, um, who is also at the uh, University of Massachusetts. And um, the point of this slide is to illustrate how um, complex psychiatric comorbidities uh, tend to be. And the fact that in child psychiatry, um, we often deal with uh, patients who have a whole host of different symptoms and different comorbidities. Um, and that, unfortunately, um, uh, multiple comorbidities or mul multiple diagnoses tends to be the rule rather than an exception um, in child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, this is a slide that um, lists um, some of the uh, important um, validated scales um, that um, um, may be used in your psychopharmacological um, evaluation. Um, so KSADS is a structured interview where the clinician asks specific questions and um, then rates the answers uh, of the patient. And it does require a training of the clinician and it, it is a fairly uh, time intensive um, intervention and it's used most commonly in um, clinical research, not in clinical practice. And it tends to be one of the gold standard um, assessments. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is the clinical global impression scale. And that's something that most clinicians use and it's, it's an impression and it consists of basically a number um, along a continuum from zero to 100 and um, that is also um, useful to um, uh, to use um, since it gives you a sense of where the patient is currently um, so that when you look back on your notes you can see if you feel like they're they're making uh, clinical progress um, other scales include the brief psychiatric rating scale this is a self-report by the patient um, um, one scale that I tend to use quite a bit in my work is um, CBCL, which stands for a Child Behavior Checklist. And um, it is a, a self-report scale that um, can be completed both by, um, by a child or adolescent and also by a parent. Um, and this scale does require um, a proprietary um, analysis. Um, so it is unfortunately not um, not in public domain, uh, but it is a very useful uh, broad um, um, range scale, which means that it covers um, pretty much all um, psychiatric conditions and um, uh, gives uh, a clinician a sense of uh, where the patient is along each psychiatric condition. Um, other scales include the Childhood Depression Rating Scale. This one is rated by a clinician. Um, I tend to use um, one called QUIDS, or um, uh, it's an inventory of depressive symptoms. Um, 
this is a, a self-report um, that um, is validated for adults and I think adolescents as well. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's a good um, uh, systematic way of assessing symptoms. Um, of course, there's a, a young mania rating scale, uh, there's a white box, um, modified alert aggression scale. And so the point of, of this slide is that it's important to familiarize yourself with uh, scales that are available. Um, a lot of them are in the public domain. So for example, QUIDS and YMRS and YBOX and um, modified avert aggression scale, they are all in the public domain, which means that you can um, search the internet and find the, the scale and you can use it. And um, it is, um, um, I, I, I would say, an important uh, component of a um, um, standard of care in a pediatric psychopharmacology evaluation. In terms of the general um, aims of the evaluation, is uh, it's of course to reduce any unsafe behaviors, but also to improve self-regulation skills of the adolescent or child, to increase the positive social interactions um, of the youth, and also to increase parent or, or guardian management skills. Um, it's important to use an interdisciplinary approach that both uh, manages the acute and chronic symptoms, but also ameliorates um, you know, core perpetuating factors, such as um, sleep deprivation, uh, communication inefficiency, environmental reinforcement of maladaptive behaviors, um, so it's really important to look at the child um, as, as a whole person and to identify uh, key um, issues that are contributing to the current um, uh, impairment and, and symptom presentation. So one of the main decisions that one has to make um, as a pediatric psychopharmacologist is um, whether to um, provide medications or not and which medications to provide. And of course, it, it is um, a, a matter of risks versus benefits. Um, and each medication uh, decision um, has um, a number of, of both of those. So when we do prescribe medications for children and adolescents, we are aiming to treat uh, biologically based disorders um, we also um, want to make sure that we are improving adaptive functioning. And um, often um, the patients that I treat um, may be so dysregulated and, and so symptomatic that without um, adequate medication support, um, they're simply not available to do the individual therapy, the family therapy, the group therapy that is really crucial in their recovery. So medications are, of course, just one part of a multimodal approach. Um, and, and it's important to use all of the other modalities available, um, psychotherapy, occupational therapy, um, involving the rest of the community, um, family therapy, you know, everything that one can use, of course, is important to use. Um, it's also important to make sure that the youth is involved in the decision-making and, and that's one of the areas where I feel um, this is more of an art than a science. Um, and I've seen different psychiatrists practice pretty much the same uh, psychopharmacology as far as the, the evidence base, but um, the approaches may be very different and the experience um, that the adolescent or a child may have uh, tends to be very different. And, and that's, um, because of the um, way that the psychopharmacologist interacts with the child. And of course, the, the more one is able to improve the relationship and therapeutic alliance with the child, the more successful the uh, psychopharmacology intervention would be. So the uh, disorders uh, in children that are medication responsive include um, most of the major disorders, um, but um, the, the greatest evidence base that we have uh, is um, for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, 
Um, there is a significant evidence base for major depression and bipolar disorder, as well as schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, uh, medications do work for anxiety disorders, um, but they are they tend to be uh, a little bit less effective um, in that area. Obsessive compulsive disorder and tick disorders medications are an important part of treatment, um, um, and and they are probably about equally important um, as as therapy. Um, sleep disorders do have um, a psychopharmacological aspect. And, and can be treated with medications, although um, non-medication treatments of sleep disorders are much more both effective and, and sustainable. Um, and this is an area where um, I, I tend to struggle, um, and we can talk more about that. Um, a condition that is not really a, a disorder, but, but a clear issue is aggression, and aggression does also respond to medications as well, and we'll talk more about that. So some of the key principles in uh, pediatric psychopharmacology include making sure that um, if there are multiple comorbid conditions um, presenting, that um, one chooses the most impairing disorder first. So for example, if somebody is having difficulty with anxiety, with um, inattention, uh, with uh, mood instability, uh, with trauma, PTSD. Um, what I usually do is um, identify the most impairing disorder. And in my experience and the way I've been trained, um, it tends to be um, either a mood disorder or psychotic illness and um, um, other symptoms such as anxiety or inattention uh, tend to follow um, afterwards. Um, trauma is an interesting uh, conundrum, um, and um, um, it, it still tends to be uh, number two um, to a mood and psychosis, um, as long as um, it's not a situation where trauma is the actual core issue and the mood symptoms and psychotic symptoms are more secondary to, to trauma. And that is a, a, a difficult um, uh, dilemma to, to address and, and so this is where one's clinical um, skill and clinical experience um, uh, comes, comes in handy. The other uh, uh, key principle for pediatric psychopharmacology is to start low and go slow. Um, so, since children um, tend to have um, um, quite a bit of sensitivity to medications and um, they tend to have different response to medications than, uh, than adults do, um, it's always um, helpful to start at the lowest possible dose and then titrate the medication um, up slowly. Um, ideally, of course, it's important to minimize polypharmacy, uh, which you know, means uh, more than one medication. Um, but in my experience, it is very difficult to do that. And so it's, it's a matter of balancing the risk versus the benefit. So um, since I know that this is mostly a non U.S. Um, audience, um, I'm not sure how much people know about um, the so-called um, FDA label uh, process, but um, in the U U.S. there is an agency that um, oversees uh, marketing um, of, say, of, of medications in general, specifically psychiatric medications. Um, this um, organization is called um, Federal Drug Administration. And its role is to make sure that um, if a medication is sold, that it is um, that what what people buy is actually what what the uh, label on the bottle says it is. Um, that was the first um, task of this um, organization. Then and then it evolved to make sure that whatever um, is prescribed and sold is also safe for use. Um, and um, uh, at some point later, uh, there was also a task of making sure that whatever is prescribed is also effective for what it says 
um, for what the label says it is. So um, because of the the way that this process has evolved in the United States, um, most of the um, information, most of the studies, and most of the um, um, FDA labels have been um, um, provided for um, medications used with adults, and very little information uh, in general exists regarding pediatric use of, of medications. Um, and that's true for both psychiatric and non-psychiatric medications. Um, and that is something that um, um, both the scientific community and, and the, the Congress is uh, trying to remedy. Um, so in the last 20 years or so, there has been an improvement in terms of um, having more of an incentive and also more of a requirement for pharmaceutical companies to actually conduct research and uh, make sure that uh, medications used um, in children um, have adequate um, uh, scientific information uh, to support the use. Um, so the best um, evidence um, that we have in terms of the research, um, which tends to parallel um, the uh, FDA uh, labeling, um, is for stimulants for ADHD. Uh, next one uh, is um, uh, selective serotonin receptor inhibitors for OCD and um, also SSRIs for anxiety and mother to severe major depressive disorder, as well as um, risperidone and, and, and ipiprazole for um, autism and um, atypical antipsychotics um, for psychosis. So um, I'd like to share with you this slide. It comes from uh, the YACAPAP uh, textbook of Child and Adolescent Mental Health. Uh, YACAPAP stands for International Association of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists. And um, this textbook um, is available um, for free online. And so I would highly encourage you to use it whenever you have a question about uh, pediatric psychopharmacology. Um, so, in this table, you see that there are two major classes of um, ADHD medications um, that are also called stimulant medications. Um, one class is um, uh, various formulations of methylphenidate, which is also known as Ritalin. Um, and the other class is various uh, formulations of uh, uh, mixed amphetamine salts, um, which is also so known uh, often as Adderall. Um, the difference in all these different um, uh, brand names is that um, these medications can be uh, formulated to be um, short-acting, intermediate-acting, and extended release. Um, they also can be um, um, refined and, um, and instead of having both optical isomers, um, some uh, stimulants um, were developed to only have one uh, optical isomer that's um, biologically active. So, for example, for methylphenidate, it's um, uh, dexmethylphenidate or focalin, um, and for uh, mixed amphetamine salts, um, it's um, Liz. Um, uh, Lisbex um, amphetamine um, or Vyvanse. Um, so the good news about um, stimulant medications for EHD is that um, these are, are um, number one, uh, probably the most effective psychiatric medications we have um, at the moment. The effect size um, on average of either methylphenidate or mixed amphetamine salts um, is um, uh, for children is, is solidly around one, sometimes even higher than one. And this is one of the highest effect sizes that, that is out there. Um, so that is one good news. The, the second good news um, is that um, stimulants have been around um, uh, for um, probably, well, about maybe 70 years or so, um, 
they um, came into um, pretty um, significant clinical practice um, in the 50s and 60s. And so um, we actually have quite a bit of safety data um, in spite of um, uh, public's concern about uh, various side effects of stimulants. And um, uh, stimulant medications um, appear to be um, fairly safe and um, uh, free of um, um, significant or you know, life-threatening um, side effects. So that's the second uh, bit of good news. Um, uh, the third um, piece of good news is that stimulant medications have actually been researched um, in children of very young age. So um, both methylphenidate and amphetamines um, have been FDA approved um, to ages um, uh, uh, between three and six years old, which is very young, and there are very few other psychiatric medications that have been approved down to this age. So, um, so there's quite a bit of good news. The challenge with um, stimulant medications is that they definitely do have um, a um, risk of uh, substance abuse, and so patients who are already at risk based on either their family history or their uh, prior psychiatric history, um, patients may um, become um, dependent on stimulants, and that is an important consideration. Um, and a lot of parents uh, worry about that and, and um, try to avoid stimulant medications. There is um, uh, quite a bit of um, literature that's coming out that actually questions whether or not um, stimulants themselves um, increase the risk of uh, substance abuse. Or an alternative hypothesis is that since um, um, children and adolescents uh, with ADHD um, have a significantly elevated risk for um, uh, various um, um, behavior problems, um, and um, uh, substance use in general, um, it is possible that stimulant medications actually decrease the risk of um, uh, substance use uh, disorders um, in children with ADHD. And there is some evidence to support that claim. Um, so that's one of the things that I share with parents when I talk about um, starting a stimulant medication. Um, other uh, potential side effects of stimulants um, include um, uh, decrease in um, appetite and trouble with sleep. Um, so that's something that's important to discuss um, with parents. Um, and there is a very small uh, increase in um, heart rate on average and uh, um, very small also increase in blood pressure on average. But, but those um, increases are, are fairly um, clinically insignificant. There are other medications um, that are used for ADHD that are non-stimulant uh, medications and therefore have less of a substance abuse risk. And they include atomoxetine, uh, guanfacine, and clonidine. And those have um, less of an uh, effect size on ADHD and they also have their own um, potential um, risks and benefits. And that, uh, for the sake of time, we will just continue. Um, in terms of um, selective um, um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, they have been approved for um, uh, conditions um, uh, of anxiety and depression um, and specifically the evidence that, that we have. Um, uh, so for OCD, it's um, uh, clomipramine, uh, fluvoxamine, um, and sertraline. Um, um, paroxetine and fluoxetine are also effective for OCD. Um, um, but um, clinically, um, there is um, um, a sense that clomipramine and fluvoxamine may be more effective since they have a more of a noradrenergic um, component. And um, I'm, it's not clear to me that research has actually supported that. Um, so fluoxetine 
um, is actually labeled in, in the U.S. Uh, for major depression uh, down to age seven, and uh, it probably has the most um, evidence base and most research behind its use in children. Um, and uh, um, I tend to start with fluoxetine um, when I am looking for an SSRI. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of the potential side effects and, and risks, it's uh, one that I feel is uh, maybe the best compromise. Um, it is uh, because it's long acting, it has um, a lower risk of um, uh, serotonin withdrawal syndrome or serotonin withdrawal side effects rather than not, not syndrome. Um, it has a um, fairly good um, tolerance um, and um, um, I feel like uh, because it has the most um, research studies um, to support its use that it, it is um, the, the antidepressant of choice um, in my practice. And there is also evidence for citalopram um, um, in adults, but no controlled trials in children. Um, there is evidence, however, for acetalopram or Lexapro, which is um, basically an isomer, optical isomer of citalopram. Um, and there is also evidence for venlafaxine. So in terms of OCD, um, a seminal trial um, is called POTS, Pediatric OCD Treatment Study. Um, and in this study, um, 112 um, children and adolescents um, um, were compared with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, sertraline, which is an SSRI or Zoloft, uh, combination of CBT and sertraline and placebo. And um, on, uh, after 12 weeks, it turned out that the combination of um, an SSRI, sertraline, uh, with CBT was actually better than either sertraline or CBT alone, which were actually relatively um, uh, the same. Um, so whether one used um, CBT for um, OCD or sertraline for OCD, the um, efficacy was about the same. And um, either of them was more effective than a placebo. So this was um, an example of, of the argument that um, combining medications with psychotherapy is always better than, um, than doing one or the other. There are also um, other medications that can be used um, uh, when there is uh, only a partial response in OCD. And so clomipramine is one, uh, clonazepam, um, um, there is um, some uh, literature to support use of lithium as an augmenting agent, um, and um, um, there's some other more sophisticated approaches as well. In terms of um, child and adolescent anxiety, the seminal study is called CAMS, or Child Adolescent Anxiety Multimodal Study. Um, it was funded by uh, National Institute of Mental Health and not by a pharmaceutical company. And it looked at separation anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and social phobia. Um, had a very strong uh, number of participants, almost 500. Um, it was 12 weeks long and um, had a similar design where um, there was a combination of um, sertraline with CBT uh, CBT and sertraline alone and, and placebo. And the result was also similar to the PAT study where the combination was most effective with the um, response um, rate of um, 81%, whereas um, CBT and sertraline alone had um, similar response rates of around 60% with placebo um, response rate of 24%. So in terms of uh, choices for uh, treatment of depression in children and adolescents, um, fluoxetine um, has uh, the, the, the most um, research um, and also an FDA approval uh, behind it. Um, sertraline um, um, has uh, quite a bit of research 
but um, because of um, um, kind of unrelated issues, it, it doesn't have an FDA approval. Um, Cetalopram is the same. Um, and Cetalopram has both research and FDA approval. Um, and uh, uh, paroxetine and fluvoxamine um, actually don't have much at this point of um, randomized control trials in children and adolescents um, and also um, don't really have an FDA approval. So um, speaking about um, acute mania, uh, this is a table that um, compares the um, evidence um, for um, adolescents um, and um, um, adults. Um, and um, uh, as you can see, there is quite a bit of evidence for adults, um, but um, not as much in adolescents. Um, so uh, lithium um, does have both research and approval, FDA approval in adolescents. Divalproex has had one uh, negative study and one positive study, so no FDA approval. Um, Alanzapin um, is approved for acute mania down to age 13. Um, carbamazepine, um, the trial was suspended, and so there is no approval, and it's not clear whether um, whether the research would support its use in children. Risperidone and quetiapine uh, were well uh, researched and war approved down to age 10 for acute mania. Um, Ziprazidone um, had a positive trial but didn't get an FDA approval. Um, and Ipiprazole um, did have um, a positive trial um, and was approved down to age 10. Um, whereas uh, tapiramate and oxcarbazepine um, both had um, a negative or no trials and do not have an FDA approval. Let's see. So in terms of the effect sizes of uh, um, mood stabilizers um, using a young mania rating scale uh, for mania, um, you will see that in um, adolescents and children um, Divalproex appears to be less effective than um, it is in adults, so about 0.3 effect size versus uh, 0.6 in adults. Um, same goes for lithium, it's a little bit less effective in uh, children and adolescents than in adults, 0.3 versus 0.5 effect size. Um, Oxcarbazepine, um, it's hard to compare because um, the warrant studies in adults uh, the pyramid um, appears to be more effective in adolescents than, than it was in adults. Um, carbamazepine, um, there are no adolescent studies. And so um, overall, if one were to uh, weight all of these different mood stabilizers um, and exclude the pyramid, um, it appears that mood stabilizers in children and adolescents are not terribly effective. The effect size is only about 0.2 relative to adults where the effect size is 0.46. So that's an important um, consideration and, and it's something that is important to know that research does not really support um, use of mood stabilizers such as uh, anticonvulsant mood stabilizers and, and lithium um, in adolescents as first, um, uh, in the first line agents. So what about atypical antipsychotics or second generation antipsychotics? Um, it appears that uh, uh, the response rate and effect size is actually much more robust in um, children and, uh, and adolescents um, when it comes to atypical antipsychotics. And you can see um, alanzapine, ziprazidone, risperidone, um, and you have both um, low dose risperidone, high dose risperidone, aipiprazole low dose and high dose, quetiapine low dose and high dose. Relative to placebo, there is a, a, a very, um, very robust um, uh, response rate for um, acute mania um, in children and adolescents. Um, 
So the effect sizes that, that um, we have for young mania rating scale change uh, in terms of the mania uh, for atypical antipsychotics much better uh, uh, relative to uh, mood stabilizers uh, when it comes to uh, adolescents versus adults. So um, pretty much most of the um, second generation antipsychotics, you have the effect size, um, uh, if you look at the weighted average of about 0.65 for children and adolescents, whereas for adults it's uh, 0.48, so a little bit lower. So it's, it's an important consideration when thinking about uh, treating a child or adolescent with acute mania, whether to choose um, uh, an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer versus um, a second generation antipsychotic. Uh, it appears that uh, the second generation antipsychotics are on average more likely to, to be effective. So um, another study um, illustrates that point. Um, so um, a study of uh, 65 um, children and adolescents uh, who were randomized to Risperidone versus Divalproex for acute mania. Uh, and you can see here on the slide that uh, there was a clear separation um, on the response to both YMRS, which is acute mania, but also response on CDRS, which is child depression rating scale, um, and also in terms of remission, um, that risperidone was consistently more effective um, than um, divalproex, although divalproex was also effective as well. So um, another interesting question has to do with um, use of um, divalproex um, in addition to stimulants for children who have um, aggression that's refractory to treatment uh, with stimulants. Um, and so this is, we are, we are switching gears a little bit. So if you think of um, children who have ADHD who continue to have aggression um, in spite of being on stimulants, the question was, well, if they have ADHD, they don't have bipolar disorder, what if we added Divalproex ER to see if that helped with refractory um, aggression? And according to this particular study, it appeared that there was um, a significant improvement um, in aggression um, with uh, Divalproex versus placebo. Um, so in terms of the um, the bipolar depression, so we've talked quite a bit about bipolar mania, um, but in terms of the bipolar depression, uh, the strength of um, evidence uh, for efficacy in controlled studies in children is, is really lacking. So if you look at this table, um, adult bipolar depression, there's quite a bit of evidence. Lithium has uh, significant evidence, um, valproid, uh, lamotrigine, the combination of olanzapine and fluoxetine, which is also called Symbiax, has strong evidence, uh, quetiapine as well. So that's all for adults. But if you look at the childhood bipolar depression, there is either negative evidence or no evidence, meaning no studies, for all of the above except for olanzapine fluoxetine combination. So unfortunately, at this point, the most effective um, treatment for childhood um, bipolar depression is a combination of olanzapine and fluoxetine. And the reason I say unfortunately is, is both because we really need more options than, than just that, and also because you know, I'm acutely aware of, of the metabolic side effects that um, olanzapine um, brings with it, um, weight gain, uh, risk of diabetes, um, um, worsening of one's lipid, lipid profile. Um, it's really olanzapine, unfortunately, while it, it is an effective medication, it, it, it does carry uh, a heavy burden of side effects. Um, one of the issues that comes up in my practice is, well, what if we have a, a patient with bipolar disorder who doesn't appear to be responding to psychopharmacology? 
And so there are many reasons for that. It may be that the diagnosis is wrong. It may be that uh, there is an agitated um, depression um, that is not uh, bipolar depression, and maybe the, the person needs a better antidepressant um, um, optimization. It may be that um, the person doesn't have a bipolar disorder, but instead has an ADHD with mood lability, and that also may influence one's um, choice of medications. It may be that there is a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which is um, basically um, a condition where uh, the person does not appear to have bipolar disorder, but also the mood dysregulation is so profound that it's not, it doesn't appear to be just major depressive disorder either. It may be there is an autism spectrum disorder that's been un under-recognized. It also may be that the person is actively abusing substances, and in that case, no medications or psychotherapy will be um, truly effective until uh, the substance ab abuse is addressed as well. It also may be that the person is diagnostically homeless, which means there is clearly something wrong, but it doesn't really fit into any of the diagnoses that we normally use. It also may be that the diagnosis is correct, however, our medications, unfortunately, are just not as effective as we would like them to be. And so we just need to keep trying medications and to make sure that we we, we do not give up on the patient, but keep looking for the um, for the possibility that uh, that the medication that hasn't been tried will work. So overall, um, looking at um, acute antipsychotic treatment uh, of of children and adolescents, um, and we are now switching gears and talking about psychosis um, in children with early onset schizophrenia. Um, which is a fairly um, rare condition, but, but it does happen. Um, this was a very um, um, large and um, meta-analysis, so 2,000, over 2,000 children and adolescents um, looking at um, um, eight antipsychotics. Um, the important finding here was that um, pretty much all antipsychotics were um, according to this study, um, fairly similar, similarly effective, except um, that the prazidone uh, appeared to be inferior, so less effective than all of the other antipsychotics. And um, acenapine, um, it sounds like it was an inconclusive finding, whether or not it was equally um, effective or maybe inferior. The other important finding of this particular meta-analysis is that Aripiprazole and quetiapine um, had the best tolerability. Um, and so um, what I usually do is um, I start with um, um, aripiprazole um, if I feel like um, the patient is able to, um, uh, the, the patient is able to tolerate a, a medicine that may, be, may not be as effective in my clinical experience. Um, and then I move on to uh, quetiapine, and then from there I usually move on to uh, olanzapine. But that's just my clinical practice. You know, it, it's um, I'm I'm not sure that I could say that that's the way to do it. Um, and even though in this particular meta-analysis, um, all of the antipsychotics, the, you know, these mostly second-generation antipsychotics were equally effective. Uh, in my clinical experience, um, quetiapine is a little bit more effective than aripiprazole, and um, alanzapine is more effective than quetiapine. Um, and what I usually tell patients and their families is that um, just like the efficacy has this order, unfortunately, the the side effect burden as far as uh, weight gain and uh, risk of glucose um, 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 problems and uh, risk of um, lipid problems is um, in the opposite direction, where aripiprazole may be the least uh, likely to cause those um, side effects. Uh, quetiapine is number two, and olanzapine is number three. Um, it, it, there is a little bit of a twist to this because um, that statement is definitely appears to be supported by um, 
research evidence in adults um, who use antipsychotics. Um, however, um, adolescents, um, ipiprazole may actually be as um, likely to cause weight gain as uh, quetiapine and maybe even the prexa or olanzapine. So it, it, it can be a little bit more complicated. So um, if the medications that we normally use do not work, um, uh, it, it is uh, very clear that there is um, uh, support for use of clozapine um, and when compared, uh, when clozapine was compared to uh, typical antipsychotics, um, it was superior in terms of both reduction of symptoms, uh, fewer relapses, um, and uh, uh, fewer side effects that were motor side effects, but it did, it did cause more drowsiness and hypersalivation uh, and temperature increases. Um, so those are the side effects to, to watch out for. Um, so the treatment implications are that um, we've talked about um, um, efficacy of uh, medications for mania, we've talked about efficacy for uh, major depressive disorder. Um, we haven't talked as much about uh, per, uh, pervasive developmental disorder, but uh, most medications also have some efficacy there. Um, and it's interesting to know that um, uh, aggression, um, pretty much um, most of these classes of medications also have efficacy for aggression as well. So lithium, Depakote, antipsychotics, antidepressants, um, ADHD medications, they all may be useful um, for uh, adolescents and children who, um, uh, who have aggression as their challenge. Uh, for um, pediatric post-traumatic stress disorder, unfortunately, there are too few studies to confirm and to make treatment recommendations. Um, I personally um, do use quite a bit of um, prazosin for nightmares, and my experience is that um, it is fairly well tolerated. Um, the main side effect is lightheadedness um, um, uh, due to either low blood pressure or um, just overall effects of uh, prazosin. And um, in general, if the uh, child or adolescent is able to tolerate prazosin increase to a, to a dose that, um, that eliminates nightmares, um, as a rule, um, nightmares do go away. So it is actually one of the most effective medications in my experience. Um, on the order of um, uh, stimulants and maybe even more effective um, than stimulants. So nightmares in PTSD, I definitely use prazosin and just watch for uh, lightheadedness or low blood pressure. Omega-3 uh, fatty acids, uh, there is some evidence for um, ADHD, uh, depression, even bipolar disorder, possibly for um, psychosis prodrome, and um, you know the evidence is still coming in. Uh, some studies have been positive, some studies have been negative. So um, I think the jury is still out on on um, how to use omega three fatty acids and their place in in treatment. Um, in terms of aggression, um, the target is um, arousal, excitability, irritability, um, and. Um, um, one could use uh, stimulants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, uh, antidepressants, beta blockers, antihistamines. Um, Clonidin and guanfacine are also used clinically, but the, the data is not there for that. So um, the last part of this talk is, um, is making sure that it's clear that atypical antipsychotics are prescribed for many conditions besides schizophrenia. Uh, they are prescribed for mood, um, for behavioral problems, um, even for ADHD. Um, and it's important to, to know that um, cardiometabolic risk is, is a very serious problem uh, with weight gain and shortened life expectancy. Um, there was a, an important study that looked at um, uh, Medicaid uh, data in uh, over 70,000 children and adolescents um, and um, um, it showed that 
when atypical antipsychotics were used together with stimulants, uh, there was not an increase in risk of type 2 diabetes. However, use of atypical antipsychotics with um, antidepressants, SSRI and SNRI, did have an increase um, in risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. So it's important to monitor um, weight and glucose and lipids um, on uh, um, in patients with atypical antipsychotics. And so, um, unfortunately, um, in the U.S., um, less than 20% uh, of psychiatrists actually um, adhere to the guidelines for monitoring, even though 95% were aware of the guidelines. So the guidelines specifically are um, to have a baseline personal and family history, uh, weight, uh, waist circumference, blood pressure, fasting plasma glucose, and fasting lipid profile, and then to repeat weight at 4, 8, 12 weeks and uh, quarterly, um, and also um, to repeat um, blood pressure, fasting plasma glucose, and fasting lipid profile at 12 weeks and annually. So what to do when um, the patient does not improve? It's important to reevaluate the diagnosis, to uh, review compliance with intervention, uh, to look at the environmental factors, um, to explore medical comorbidities, um, to consider a cytochrome P450 testing, and also to look at psychiatric comorbidities. Is it that uh, the patient is actively using substances and that's why uh, they're not improving. So this concludes this, this um, overview. Um, I know this was a lot of information, and I'm sorry that uh, there isn't much time um, uh, for questions, um, but um, maybe there, there are a couple of questions that I could take. Uh, like, 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 like,